Why, hello there. Brent here with Bring Your Own Tools, and on today's episode, we completely transformed this concrete slab with engineered hardwood flooring. If you want to know how to do it, keep on watching. Let it start. We are starting with a rough looking concrete slab and the reason why we are is because this was an existing carpet area and when the contractors decided to spray the paint onto the walls they decided not to protect the concrete which is why we are the lucky ones that get to remove all of the paint and the texture that is on the concrete before we even get to flooring. And my personal favorite device to remove any type of remnants on this concrete is a diamond wheel that's attached to my grinder and the grinder is hooked up to my shop vac with this protective shield that goes around the grinder. This makes it extremely easy to remove all this leftover paint on the concrete, but it also makes sure that it's not too dusty in here. It will automatically get some dust moved around here and there, but the vast majority is sucked up into my shop vac. Now one important step when working with a concrete slab is to test for moisture. And the easiest way to do this is to actually take your grinder, grind down a specific area, and once that area is fully ground down, take a piece of Visqueen with four pieces of tape, let it sit for 24 to 48 hours, and come back. If there's no moisture or discoloration into the concrete, then seemingly you don't have much moisture within your concrete, and a glue should easily be able to adhere to it properly for years to come. I seemingly forgot to record this step when I was doing this project, which is why this footage is from an old epoxy garage floor that I did last year. But of course the same principles apply for this project. And as for this project, we have some trim around our bathroom doors and our closet area, which is why I take a scrap piece of the flooring and my multi-tool to remove the excess trim around the door so we can get a perfect fit once we start installing our flooring. Now that we're finally done creating dust, it's now time to suck up and clean this entire slab with my shop vac. An easy once over with the shop vac is all you need because we want to have this area completely clean before we install our flooring. And speaking of flooring, let's get right to it. This is six inch wide white oak flooring from Flooring Direct Warehouse. Now they provided all the material for this project, which is why they're the sponsor of this week's video. And it's an absolutely beautiful product that I loved installing in my last video, which was a nail down version of the same exact product. But this is a full tutorial on how to apply it via glue down, which we'll jump into right now. The starting point of our project for a glue down method is extremely important because all of our alignment is working off of this point, which is why I'm actually making a mark on the floor at which I want the first row to start at, and then taking a chalk line across to make sure I have a completely straight line from one side of the room to the other. On this project, we're using a quarter inch V-notch trowel, and for the glue, we are using Bostick's Best, which is a perfect tried and true product for engineered hardwood flooring. Just know ahead of time, this glue is not cheap, but you do get what you pay for because it's a very high quality product. I suggest starting off with a small amount of glue first so you can really work within the space and make sure your first row of boards are perfectly straight right across your chalk line. I position my first board in the glue and just give it a little bit of push to make sure that that glue adheres properly all the way across the board. As I position the second board into the tongue and groove of the side of the first board, I raise it up to a 45 degree angle approximately and then slide the tongue into the groove end while lowering the board. Since this first row is actually right adjacent to a stairwell, we do have to cut a small section out of this first row to make sure we have a perfectly straight line all the way across our chalk line. After I mark my lines with a speed square, I then take my jigsaw to cut the piece appropriately. And the jigsaw really makes it easy to cut these weird unique shapes and areas, especially with the fact that you don't have to worry if these cuts are perfect due to the fact that wall base will be going right on top of it. When I position pieces like this, I do try and slide it in and then push it down into the glue, but sometimes it's so tight you're going to have to push it down into the glue and then slide it into position. A very important step to do at this point is to actually position these floor spacers on the back side of this very first row. This will guarantee and make sure that when you're actually pounding the next rows in, that the first row alignment won't get screwed up in the process. 
I'm gonna go into much larger detail about actually pounding all of these boards in place with the proper tools and techniques, but the main point that I wanted to get across at this time was the fact that you wanna get a few rows in and then actually let it dry overnight. You obviously don't have to do it this way, but I find it's extremely easy to work on a floor if you have a very sturdy surface to work upon and work against. We put some weights on it overnight, and now it's permanently bonded to the floor, so I don't ever have to worry about this section moving as I'm installing the remainder of the floor. Just like our previous nail down installation, one of the key aspects when installing this floor is to make sure you're accounting for the seam locations. Each seam location should be no closer than six inches from each other, and you wanna make sure that they're all staggered apart from each other. Which in all honesty is quite easy to do since this flooring comes 23 to 86 inches long. Quite a difference. In sections where you have a long straight shot with no odd cuts, you might actually find it easier to stack and align your boards first and then apply your glue. And as you can see, we have quite a bit of glue to apply on this entire floor, which is why we wanna make sure we have the proper V-notch trowel associated with that flooring. Keep in mind that depending on the subfloor and the material that you're using, the notch size might differ from installation to installation. So just keep that in mind on your project if you don't have these exact materials or subfloors to work upon. The main tools I use for the installation is a pull bar and a sizable mallet. This makes the installation process extremely easy and installing it this way actually is much faster than trying to nail it down, at least with my personal experience. This is mainly due to the fact that when installing via the staple method, the staples tend to damage the tongue in some locations and therefore made it harder to install. But with this method, the tongue and the groove is perfect and therefore it slides in with a breeze and makes the installation process much faster. But you know what doesn't make the installation process fast? Yeah, cutting around doorways, but that's okay and understandable because you're gonna have those issues. I always find, again, using a speed square to determine exactly where the depths are, marking my lines appropriately, and then using my jigsaw makes it extremely easy to make those cuts around the doorway sections. I do suggest dry fitting these pieces in first, and then as long as you have it at the right size, you can then position it appropriately with adhesive. You don't want to get this piece in while there's glue down and then realize, oh yeah, I need to make a new cut. Not fun. This is also the first area where we installed flooring under existing trim work, and as you can see, it slid in perfectly the very first time underneath our existing trim and provides a perfect finish in the end. As you work yourself into larger, more continuous spaces, I suggest making it easier on yourself and just pouring out a large amount of glue onto the surface and then spreading it accordingly with your V-notch trowel. Once you get to the tail end of your bucket, I basically just flip it over onto its end, let it rest there for 10 minutes, and then you come back to a glorious mob of glue that was at the bottom that would have taken a little effort to do if you had to scrape it all out yourself. So let gravity work for you on this project. But with all this glue comes the fact that you will be getting some of it on the floor no matter how hard you try not to. The best product that I've found thus far to remove this glue is just some mineral spirits and a clean cloth, and as long as the glue is still wet, it's extremely easy to remove with this, but even if it is dried on there, you can still fully remove the glue with mineral spirits in a rack. Just might need a little bit extra oomph. And when I say oomph, that basically just means more rubbing. As I get close to my next doorway, we do have to be a bit unique in the installation process because we have to get underneath both door casings, but when considering the tongue and groove aspect as well as where we're positioned, it tends to get a bit tricky. But the way that I was just doing it is to actually have your seam right in the middle of the doorway. That way you can slide one side in and position that piece correctly. Once that piece is positioned properly, you can then cut your second piece. But the trick about the second piece is that you actually cut the bottom of the groove side that's going to be adjacent to the seam that's right in the middle of the doorway. In order to make this cut extremely easy, I just set the depth to the appropriate size and that just slices off the very bottom portion of our groove on that side. This way we're able to slide the board in place underneath our door casing while also fitting it into the groove side on the back side, but it also snaps in place in the very middle of our doorway because we cut the bottom groove out. 
I also placed a few floor wedges on the back corner here in order to guarantee that our floor won't be coming apart or adjusting as we install the remainder of our floor. As you can see, we had a large couch in this area, which was actually quite a bit cumbersome to try and get upstairs and out of the way. So we just put it on one side of the room and then moved it back to the other side once we installed up to it. This provided a really nice, easy solution for this room and we didn't have to go up the stairs with a very large couch. Again, I wanted to say a huge thank you to our sponsor this week, Flooring Direct Warehouse, for providing the materials for this project. This flooring really is extremely high quality and a beautiful veneer on an engineered hardwood flooring product. If you want to check out this product for yourself, I'll make sure and leave a link in the description box below to see where you can purchase it or any of the other tools or materials seen in this video. As we butt ourselves up right to the very last row of our wall, we seemingly are able to fit a full board at this very section. Pretty incredible. And as I used before, you still want to apply your floor wedges to guarantee that none of these boards come loose throughout the drying process. Now, if you're wondering why we're installing engineered hardwood flooring up to the fireplace, please note that this fireplace will be removed and actually replaced with a gas zero clearance fireplace, which means we don't have to install any type of fireplace hearth throughout this area. This provides a bit more of a modern look, and after we have a few more wedges in place, guess what? We are done! I truly love how this entire room turned out. This flooring adds so much warmth and beauty to this entire space, and it completely transformed a very sad looking concrete slab into something so beautiful and desirable. And that's what I call one beautiful, sexy beast. Now, the stairs. But that can wait till next week. <laughs>